it's hard to believe that, but we are in sixth week of our series on Joseph. And over the past few weeks, we've discovered that God gave Joseph a pair of incredible dreams, but he went through all kinds of suffering before those dreams became a reality. Last week, if you were here, we saw Joseph's old wounds just kind of ripped wide open when his brother showed up to buy grain. And these are the same brothers that sold him into slavery over 20 years ago. And as we look at Genesis 42 through 44 last week, it was interesting. We just kind of contrasted the responses between Reuben and Judah, and Reuben continued to kind of shift the blame for what they had done to Joseph, but we, we talked about, we saw how Judah was willing to take responsibility for his role in the wrong. Judah recognized the wrong. He took ownership of what he had done, and he faced the pain that he had created or had caused. And so we asked this question, where in your life do you have broken relationships that you desperately need God to heal? Where in your life do you have broken relationships where you just really long for God to show up and begin to heal those relationships? There are steps that we can take toward healing those relationships. We can acknowledge the wrong, we can take ownership of our wrongs, and we can face the pain that we've caused. And listen, those steps aren't easy. And we talked about this last week. Man, sometimes those are really painful. But those steps will begin to move us toward healing. It may, it may not happen overnight, and, and let's just be honest, there's some relationships that this side of heaven may never be completely restored. But if we submit our brokenness to God and we begin to take these steps, God can begin to heal our brokenness. Well, today we're going to move into chapters 45 and 46. If you want to go ahead and open up in Genesis chapter 45, once again, I'm not going to read through all of those. Um, I'm actually going to kind of quickly paraphrase what's going on in those two chapters, and then we're going to jump back to Genesis 45, and we're going to spend some time in those first about eight verses really digging that apart and kind of looking into what takes place there. So after Judah takes ownership of his wrongs, at the end of chapter 44, we move into chapter 45, and once again, we see Joseph, he, he just can't contain his emotion any longer. He can't hold it back. And he tells all of his officials and his servants to leave the room. And, and then he finally reveals his identity to his brothers. And, and it's a shocking moment for his brothers, as you could imagine. And, and after talking with them for a little bit, Joseph says, hey, I want you to go back to our father Jacob. I want you to bring him here to Egypt so that our whole family can live here under my protection in Egypt. So the brothers head back to, to their dad, to Jacob. And, and as you can imagine, when Jacob gets that news that his long lost son, his favorite son that he once thought was dead, uh, is actually alive. Jacob is stunned. Scripture tells us he actually doesn't even really believe them at first. He's struggling with that, as, as we can all imagine. But they finally convince him that Joseph is alive, and the whole family begins to make their way back to Egypt. And I, can you just imagine what those conversations looked like or sounded like on the way back to Egypt between the brothers and Jacob? I can only imagine what, what those conversations were like. Along the way, though, we read that Jacob receives a message from God, and it's kind of similar to that message that his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac received. Jacob has this vision of God at night where God reminds Jacob of these promises that he has given to his family, and he tells Jacob, I am God. I am the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go to Egypt because I'm going to make you into a great nation there. So Jacob goes, and then we see in chapter 46 this list, this genealogy of all the children and the grandchildren of Jacob who are traveling to Egypt. It says there that, that at this point there are 66 members of Jacob's family traveling to Egypt. So if you count Joseph's family in that number, there are 70 people that are now in Jacob's family. Think about that promise that God gave to Abraham and Sarah just a couple generations ago, and now there are 70 family members. You can just begin to see how God is fulfilling those promises that he gave to Abraham and, and then to Isaac and now to Jacob. He is beginning to establish his people. And then there's this great reunification between Jacob, the father, and Joseph, the long-lost son, and, and it's a beautiful moment, but I hate to tell you, we're not going to spend much time looking at that. I know it's really cool, it's a great moment, but I've got some other things we're going to look at this morning. So we're not going to spend any time on that today. We're going to go back again to chapter 45. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, chapter 45. I want us to look at these first kind of eight verses of Joseph's response to his brothers coming to him. And again, at the end of chapter 44, Judah is unaware of who Joseph is. He still does not know 
who Joseph is. But we see him take ownership and he faces into the pain that he has caused Joseph. And, and this kind of begins to set the stage for the work of reconciliation to begin to take place. Now we're going to look at two concepts this morning to get us started. We're going to look at the concept of forgiveness and reconciliation. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a definition of, a, a simple definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a releasing of the resentment that we have toward those who have done something wrong to us. A releasing of the resentment that we have toward those who have done something wrong to us. Forgiveness is, in a sense, it's an action. It's an event that takes place. Sometimes you have to forgive people multiple times, but forgiveness is an action. And reconciliation, on the other hand, is a process or a journey towards restoration of a relationship with those whom we have a broken relationship. It's a process. It's a journey. So to, just to put it in simple terms, forgiveness is releasing resentment. Reconciliation is a journey toward restoration. Now, I want you to, to think about this for a moment. Forgiveness is something that you can do on your own. You can forgive someone on your own. But reconciliation requires two parties. Reconciliation requires two parties. Forgiveness is something that can happen once. You can forgive someone and you can move on and, and be done with that. Uh, but reconciliation takes an extended journey of people who were separated coming back and being close to each other. So let me give you a picture of, of kind of what we're talking about. Think about a bridge for a moment. Maybe we'll call it a bridge of reconciliation. If there's a relationship that has been broken, reconciliation is like the bridge that you would begin to build in order to restore that relationship. There's been a, a break in the relationship and now there is a chasm between two people. There's a huge gap, a canyon that separates them. And for reconciliation to happen, there has to be a building of the bridge on both sides. It's gotta be on both sides in order for that gap to be overcome. There has to be a rebuilding of trust that enables people to walk back and forth on that bridge of reconciliation to restore that relationship. Now, if only one party wants reconciliation, it's really hard to experience reconciliation when it's one-sided. In fact, I, I think it's impossible. It's really impossible for that to happen. It requires both parties being willing to step towards the bridging that gap and restoring that relationship. That's the process or the journey of reconciliation. Sometimes there are situations in our lives that do not enable us to have reconciliation with someone because for a lot of reasons, maybe because they've passed on, maybe there's a distance, maybe they just don't want that reconciliation and they're not willing to help build that bridge together. And so in those situations, we need to continue to do what we can, but sometimes we just have to wait and we have to call out to God and we have to pray and we have to continue to leave that relationship in God's hands. But in this story this morning that we're going to look at, we've witnessed Joseph and his brothers and they're on a journey. We've been looking at it the last couple of weeks. They're on a journey of forgiveness and reconciliation. And so let's see how this plays out. Chapter 45. Again, if you have a Bible, we'll have it on the screen for you as well. We're going to start with verse 1, Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me there because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. See, Joseph has been pretty self-controlled throughout this whole process, really, for the most part. Last week, we saw these moment, a couple of moments where he kind of ran out of the room, and he just emotionally, he could not hold back the emotion any longer, that he'd been carrying all this pain and grief that he'd endured. And in this moment, it's almost, you know, last week we said there was a moment where it was like there was a crack in the dam, and the emotion began to spill out. In this moment, it's like the whole dam just falls apart, and it's all let out, and he's just 
overcome with grief and, and just emotion. He can't contain it anymore. And when the brothers show up and Judah comes to this place where, again, even though he has no idea he's talking to Joseph, he's willing to acknowledge the wrongs. He's willing to take ownership of what they did. And he's finally willing to deal with the consequences of what they did. And so, yes, I believe Joseph is, in this moment, we see him weeping. I believe he's grieving over some of the pain. But I also think in this moment, I just can't help but think that maybe he's filled with emotion because he's beginning to see the first glimpses, the first hope of a relationship that just might be restored because the brothers are acknowledging the wrongs. In our own lives, there are times when people wrong us and they just refuse to acknowledge the wrong. And when we're not able to acknowledge the wrong, listen, it, it just does not allow for reconciliation to happen. No matter how much you want to build that bridge of reconciliation, if someone continues to remain in denial of the wrong that they've done, we, we should, we can, and we should still forgive them, but reconciliation is not going to happen. Now, in this situation, the brothers, they've already started to kind of build out that bridge because they've acknowledged the wrong. And I just think part of the reason that Joseph is overcome with emotion in this passage is because he realizes that there is a trust that can allow those first kind of building blocks of that foundation of this bridge of reconciliation to begin to be built. And he, as he kind of sees that, I want you to see what Joseph does. There's something that he does that I think requires a great deal of vulnerability. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And it says that, that his brothers are terrified. Of course they are, right? They thought Joseph was long gone, and now this powerful official, second in command over all of Egypt, is telling them that he is the brother that they sold off into slavery. And verse 4 says that Joseph says to them, come close to me. And I kind of picture Joseph calling them to, calling them to come to him and and I just have this image of him as he kind of leans into his brothers. And again, keep in mind, now he's speaking in a language that they can understand. And he reveals to them that he is their brother. Now watch what happens here. Joseph says to his brothers, come close to me. And I don't know about you, I just wonder what were they thinking in that moment. I just wonder what they were thinking. Their minds had to be spinning. Can this really be Joseph? What's he going to do to us now? Is he going to throw us in jail? Is he going to kill us? Of course, that's not what happens, but Joseph draws them close to himself in this powerful moment, and he really continues to build this bridge of reconciliation. You see, to build the bridge of reconciliation, we must be willing to close the gap. We have to be willing to close the gap. We have to be willing to get in each other's space, and that can be extremely uncomfortable. You ever get around somebody that doesn't understand the concept of personal space? You know, like they step into you and you kind of step back and they just keep, and you're like, whoa, right? If you've not experienced that, then it might be you, but we still love you. <laughs> this idea of personal space, man, when people get into that, that can be really, it can be really uncomfortable. But when it comes to reconciliation, we cannot cross the bridge of reconciliation if we keep pushing the other person away. We cannot reconcile if we're going to keep that other person at a distance. We have to be willing to close the gap. You know, the crazy thing about that is that we all know that if someone has wronged us, when someone has caused us pain, our natural response is, pro is not proximity, is it? It's distance. When someone wrongs us, the natural response is to kind of push away or to step back. That's, and that's normal, and, and, I, and that's healthy. Okay, that's a healthy response. If somebody's wronged you, the normal response is actually to step back and to protect yourself with distance. And that is normal and that is healthy. And we need to pay attention to those things in life because there is a wisdom in keeping distance if we're talking about someone who's unsafe in our life, right? If there's someone who is unsafe in our life, then we do need to, to keep some distance. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about an unsafe person. We're talking about the necessary bricks of trust that are laid for a foundation of a bridge of reconciliation to be built. And in order for that to happen, we need to be willing to be vulnerable. And we need to be willing to close the gap. And that reconciliation begins to take place through proximity of being close to that person again. And the scary thing about that is if you've ever been hurt by somebody, if someone's wronged you, proximity and vulnerability means that you're opening yourself up to potentially being hurt again. 
by inviting that person to come close, you're kind of putting yourself out there. And it's a risk. But the question is, do you want to reconcile that relationship? Do you want reconciliation to happen? It's risky, and it may not always be returned. And listen, man, it can be painful, but it's necessary if we really want reconciliation to happen. So Joseph, we kind of get this image of him kind of pulling his brothers in close. And, and then he says this, he says, I am your brother Joseph. And, and then this one really, I think, powerful sentence, it's small but powerful, he says, the one you sold into Egypt. You see, Joseph just names the wrong. He, he, he does what has to be done in order for reconciliation to take place. You have to name the wrong. You can't bury it. You can't hide it. You really have to be able to identify it. I am the one you sold into slavery. And that one little sentence, man, that, there is so much packed into that one little sentence. I was sold into slavery in Egypt. I'm the one that you sold. I'm the one that you rejected. I'm the one that you faked my death and you have no idea the suffering that I've endured as a result of the wrong that you've committed. So Joseph just names the wrong. Reconciliation means we actually have to name those wrongs out loud. We have to be able to speak it and name it. You can't hide it in a back room. You can't bury it and pretend like it didn't happen because if you do, it's a fake relationship. You know what I'm saying? It's not real. It's not authentic. We have to be able to identify those wrongs. If you're really going to restore the relationship, it requires the person who has done the wrong to hear what's been done wrong. And again, that's an extremely hard step to take but it's necessary if we want reconciliation to happen. Now, in many of our relationships that have been broken, the person who's done the wrong, they may refuse to hear the reality of that wrong. Anybody else ever experienced that? They just refuse to hear or to listen to what's taken place, the, what they've done to you. They refuse to hear that. Um, they just refuse to name it as a reality. And as, as a result, reconciliation of that relationship can't happen. Complete reconciliation can't happen if they're not willing to, to identify that or acknowledge it. Forgiveness can happen, right? Forgiveness can happen from someone who's, who, who has had resentment for that wrong, but reconciliation will not happen until reality is accepted and both people begin to kind of step out onto that bridge and they begin to build that bridge of reconciliation. Now, Joseph knew because he'd already heard from Judah that the brothers were acknowledging some real wrongs that had happened. And, and so Joseph, in this one single sentence, 13 years worth of suffering, he puts into this one sentence, but he begins to build this bridge of reconciliation. And, and you go, you got to hear this next part, because it's so fundamental to how Joseph is able to forgive and to begin to reconcile that relationship. And you, you hear this, and you're like, how could Joseph possibly forgive them? And, and this is why, this is, this is what it says in verse 5. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Did you hear that? How on earth could Joseph say that to his brothers? How could he, how could he forgive them after what they had done to him? Well, this is how. Joseph had come to terms with the wrongs. And I don't know exactly when that took place. We don't know for sure. Maybe it was while he was in prison. Maybe it was when Pharaoh raised him to be second in command. He finally kind of came to terms with that. I don't know. But at some point, something began to happen in Joseph's life where the memories he had of the past pains were transformed through the lens of faith. Joseph has come to terms with the reality of those things. And he's actually released resentment toward those who have wronged him, and he has forgiven them. In fact, in this sentence right here, I, I, Joseph is just saying, hey, don't get too stressed out. You know, don't be angry with yourselves for what you did. And that tells us that Joseph has gone through a transformation. Something has happened in Joseph's life. And there may be some here this morning that you've gone through some really terrible, terrible things. Maybe you've had some horrible things happen in your life, some painful things. And I just, I want to ask you this question. Is it possible that God can take those dark places of our lives is it possible that God can take the brokenness and the suffering and the wrong? Not that God would want that to happen, because I don't, I don't believe God wants us to suffer. Not that he wants that to happen, but can he take that in his hands and can he release our hearts? You see, resentment can often take us on a pathway into bitterness, where our hearts and our souls become so hardened that we cannot move past the pain. 
Resentment can turn our hearts into a heart of stone that's filled with bitterness and anger. And if you're in that place this morning, I just would encourage you to call out to God and say, God, would you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, begin to soften my heart? Would you help me? Would you, in the way that only you can, would you help me release the resentment and release those who have wronged me, that I might not be hardened into this place of bitterness? Some of us, we need to go on that journey of forgiveness. And listen, I'm not saying it's, it's easy. And, I'm, and I am not oversimplifying it. I'm not trying to make light of the deep, painful wounds that have been caused in our lives. Don't misunderstand me. It's a deep journey where we first reach out to God and we say, God, would you help me in my heart to release the resentment? Joseph went on that journey. And listen, he has not forgotten what they've done. He's not forgotten what they've done. Those painful memories have not gone away. Some people, sometimes I hear people say things like, forgive and forget. Any of you ever hear that? Forgive and forget, right? We say that. I just want you to know that's nonsense. That's nonsense, right? You cannot forgive and forget. We have, God has gifted us with incredible memories that will not allow us to forget our painful experience. So I just want you to right now just go ahead and throw away that cliche because it's nonsense. It doesn't work and it's impossible. If you're waiting to forgive someone until you forget, forgiveness will never happen. It's never gonna happen. This is what I want you to see about Joseph. He has not forgotten what they've done to him. But instead of focusing on the pain that they caused through this lens of suffering, he now focuses those memories through the lens of faith. He says, don't be afraid and don't be angry with yourselves for what you've done because God had a plan. God sent me ahead to Egypt. See, he remembers the events, but the way that he sees them, the way that he interprets them is through the eyes of faith in such a profound way that he believes that God used what man intended for evil, God has used it for good. And you just got to track this as he keeps talking. He goes on, he says, for two years now, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now, I know that can sound pretty superficial, but it's coming out of, I believe, a place, a, a very deep place of faith in Joseph's life where he understands that God is sovereign even in the midst of his suffering. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that God creates the suffering in our lives. That's not what I'm saying. But in a world that's marked by evil and brokenness and pain because of sin, suffering will happen. And God can still take what people intend for evil in our lives and he can redeem it and he can buy it back. And in the upper story of our lives, right? We've been talking about that upper story. God can do something in that upper story. And that's what Joseph is saying. By faith, he sees through a different set of lenses. I, I've shared with you many times uh, in our time together, but for Amanda and me, one of the most difficult and painful seasons of our lives was walking through that seven years of infertility. It was the darkest season of our life. And there were plenty of times during those seven years Man, I, I questioned God. There were times when I struggled with how on earth could a good and loving God deny us of the one thing that we both so desperately long for, to be parents. And listen, I would not want to walk through that season again, but I know this. Looking back, I can see how God never once abandoned us. He was with me every step of the way. And, and he's made something beautiful in my life out of that season. And my faith grew so much as I came out of that season. And I've said this many times to, to many people, I wouldn't trade a second of those seven years, the pain, the darkness, I wouldn't trade any of that for anything in the world. Because today I have six amazing kids that call me dad. And listen, I'm not saying that, that each and every one of us would say that about all the pain, painful things in our lives. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that my experience of this painful season, now 18 years out of that season with six kids, and I would not change the season of pain and hurt because through it, God has brought some amazing kids into our life. 
And he's used our season of pain to bring hope and life to so many other couples who are walking through that painful struggle of infertility, that journey of infertility. Today, I look at that season through a different lens. You know what I'm saying? I look at it through a different lens. I look at it through a lens of faith. And in these verses, we can see that Joseph is looking at his suffering through a lens of faith. And I just want to invite you to begin to see your suffering through the eyes of faith. That God, who is still at work in the midst of a broken world, that he can somehow, in a mysterious and powerful and spiritual way, that he can work all things together for good, for our good and for his glory, in the midst of the lives of those who are loving him and who are called according to his purposes. Listen, that's not a superficial truth written on a bumper sticker. That's not just a saying for a t-shirt or a, or a hat or whatever it might be, right? That is a deep truth that comes out of the deepest, darkest places of our lives. That God is still able to bring glory to his name in the midst of our suffering. Joseph suffered. We've looked at that. I mean, he really suffered. And as he stands face to face with his brothers, the ones who inflicted that wrong on him, his perspective is shaped with the eyes of faith. There's a bigger story. There's an upper story that God is telling, an upper story in which God is working. And that is a deep, deep truth. Joseph believes it. And he allows that to shape his ability to step forward with vulnerability and with proximity to kind of hold in his hands the dark, painful seasons of his life, but to see it through the eyes of faith. The story goes on this way. He says to his brothers, now hurry back to dad, say to him, and this is what you're supposed to say to dad, God has made me the Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You still live in the land of, or the region of Goshen. Be near me, you and your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I'm gonna provide for you here because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You see, Joseph is reaching out again. He's drawing them in. He's reaching out an open hand and he's continuing to build this bridge of reconciliation, even with his family. Then he says to his brothers, you can see for yourselves so that my, my brother Benjamin, this is really who I am. This is who I'm talking. This is me who's talking. Tell my father about all the honor that's uh, given to me in Egypt and everything that you've seen. And bring my father down here quickly. And then it says he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and he wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all of his brothers and, and he wept over them. And, and it says they have this conversation. There's something happening as Joseph reaches out with vulnerability and proximity. And now he reaches out his hands to see if they'll reach back and respond in relationship. And they do. And they embrace each other. And through the journey of them taking ownership and Joseph naming the wrongs and closing the gap and seeing the wrongs through the lens of faith, we're seeing the beginnings of this bridge of reconciliation that continues to be built. Now, it's just the first steps. Because we'll see later on that the brothers, there's still some stuff. There's still some fear they have going on. They're still not quite completely sure yet, right? It doesn't happen in one quick step. Where Remember, reconciliation is a journey. It's a process. It takes time. You can't force someone to reconcile a relationship, especially when they're living in denial. But you can choose the way of forgiveness. And forgiveness isn't easy, but it's powerful. And it's at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? that God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us even while we don't deserve that forgiveness. You see, the calling of Christians in the midst of a world that's built on vengeance and revenge is to release resentment toward those who have wronged us. Just as Christ has forgiven us, we're called to forgive others. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. This is what he writes. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. And then what does he say? Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. See, we're commanded to forgive with the same measure that Christ has forgiven us. And the risk in not doing that is that our hearts become hardened and we just become full of bitterness and anger. But the invitation of God in Jesus Christ is to allow his spirit in us to begin to soften our hearts and enable us to release the resentment that's there because of the cross. And I don't know about you, but I know I do not deserve the forgiveness that comes to me through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. 
In the same way that our God has given us what we don't deserve, we could never earn, we do the same for others. You forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Don't forgive and forget, because that's not going to happen. You forgive and you remember what Jesus did for you. You remember the cross. And because of the cross, you and I can be right with God. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We give it as we've received it. Some of us this morning, I I just wonder if some of us this morning, we need to take a step toward forgiveness. And, And forgiveness, listen again, it's not easy. It's not simple. But the calling of Christ is to take a step forward. Are you teetering on the edge of resentment towards either bitterness or forgiveness? And if you are, I just want to kind of nudge you. I want to kind of push you today towards forgiveness because of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to lean towards forgiveness because that is the heart of God. But there's a great difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, right? Some of you know exactly what I'm saying when I say forgiveness is like a doorway and reconciliation is like walking across a bridge. Sometimes it can feel like that bridge is going nowhere. And for some of us, we've experienced the first steps of trying to reconcile and someone holding up their hands and saying, I'm not interested. And they're not willing to even take that step out onto that bridge. And if you've been in that place, I just want to encourage you to continue to call out to the living God and to stay in that place of forgiveness and say, Lord, I trust you, even if I never get the chance to reconcile. See, God's heart is reconciliation, but two human hearts have to go there together. And we have an opportunity to be agents of reconciliation in the world. That's what Paul says in another one of his letters. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, this is what he writes. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That God is reconciling us to himself, and he's inviting us into this pathway of his peace. And we have an opportunity to step forward with God as agents of reconciliation and to take those steps along the way. Do you feel like God is calling you to reconcile with someone today? And if so, can I just kind of, again, nudge you along? Maybe push you forward on that pathway? Can I just encourage you to just begin to talk to God about it this morning?